For us, the exaggerated structures on these insects are sort of an extreme, an end of a continuum. The, the morphologies of these animals are almost ridiculous. And so it's hard to look at that and not wonder how it's possible. I mean, how could you build an animal like that and have it survive and thrive and actually function or persist as a population for millennia when they look that screwed up and that crazy? So at some level, we're interested in them because we're interested in diversity. And these are some of the extremes of morphological diversity that you find anywhere. And so in our case, we usually study rhinoceros beetles with really big horns. Um, but most of us are working in one way or another on the development and the evolution of these exaggerated structures, the weapons in these beetles. And so the, the, the concepts and the, and the backdrop, the behavior and the mating system is generalizable. But we're also learning that the genetics and the details of the mechanisms are generalizable too. So a big part of what we've done recently is to look at how nutrition influences the growth of these big structures and why it is that high nutrition translates into a really big weapon. And so the, the real benefit to the big weapons is those males guard the key real estate and because they have the key real estate, they mate with the most females in the populations. But there's definitely evidence that big males um, are more likely to win fights and uh, among size match males, the males with the largest horns are the most likely to win fights. Um, but just like we see in the field, in our battle box, the males are, are fighting over food sources and fighting over females, and they use their horn to like flick off the opponent and try and get him away. But in the battle box, the, the loser doesn't really go away very far, so <laughs> they just keep fighting. So, so these are weapons. They're used by males in fights over, over access to females. So as a structure, they're analogous in every respect to antlers that you'd see in deer or elk or any of the charismatic sort of megafauna with weapons. Um, except in this case, we can study them in ways you can't study with, I mean, it's very hard to do a genetic breeding experiment on elk or on bison. But with these guys, we can rear them in the laboratory. So we can start to look at the, the nitty gritty, sort of opening the car and looking under the hood and finding out the details of how these amazing structures both form during development and change over time through the process of evolution. So a big part of what we do is sort of bringing a variety of different approaches to bear on these crazy structures to look at how they evolve and why they evolve.